All right, everybody, welcome back to our study of the book of Daniel. Let's just jump right in and we'll see uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to erect an image and demand everyone to worship it here in Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. All right, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width was 6 cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So there's a, uh, there is considerable debate regarding when this happened. Some will think it's a short time after the events of Daniel chapter 2, but others will think it happened many years later. Uh, there is a discernible link between Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2 and this image that he made in chapter 3. And so it seems that Nebuchadnezzar deliberately made an entire statue of gold to say that the day of his reign and authority would never end. And that's in total contradiction to God's declared plan. So he makes this image of gold. And the image was more like a stylized obelisk rather than a normal statue, uh, being 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And so being so large, it's safe to say that it's not made of solid gold, but it's probably wood overlaid with gold. And this was a common method of construction in the ancient world. All right. Verses 2 and 3. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. All right, so a satrap is a Persian loan word that means protector of the realm. It refers to a specific category of public officials. And so the demand that all come to this dedication ceremony means that Nebuchadnezzar meant to, to use the worship of this image as a test of allegiance. All right, verses 4 through 6, the command to worship this image. All right, verse 4. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, then you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace." So some of these musical instruments are difficult to define precisely, but the idea is still clear. It's an impressive orchestra. And so the use of the Aramaic words for lyre, psaltery, and symphony has led some critics to say that the book of Daniel was written hundreds of years after the time of Daniel. They will say that this is because those particular words are Aramaic words borrowed from the Greek words, and supposedly Daniel did not have these words at his disposal in the 6th century B.C., and they supposedly did not come into the Hebrew vocabulary until the 3rd century B.C. Nevertheless, ancient records are going to tell us that there were Greeks in the region of Assyria, Babylon, and Persia as far back as the 8th century B.C. Archaeology also proves beyond a doubt that Greek mercenaries fought and made military settlements in and around Judea before the time of Daniel. All right, so whoever doesn't fall down is going to be cast into this um, burning, fiery furnace. So the command was backed up by a powerful threat here, bow down or be put to death. And so Nebuchadnezzar regarded the refusal to worship the image as treason, not only just as a religious offense. So in this, Nebuchadnezzar was just like many politicians who often seem willing to use religion to strengthen their grip on political power. Politicians are happy to blend together spiritual allegiance and national allegiance. Uh, an example of this was displayed in 1936 when Herr Balder von uh, Schickrach, the head of the youth program for Nazi Germany, said, If we act as true Germans, we act according to the laws of God. Whoever serves Adolf Hitler, the Fuhrer, serves Germany, and whoever serves Germany serves God. Another example comes from 1960 when the president of Ghana had a slightly larger than life-size statue of himself erected in front of the National House of Parliament. An inscription on the side of the statue reads, Seek ye first the political kingdom, and all other things shall be added unto you. And the, So the statue was destroyed after a bloodless coup in 1966. 
All right, so Nebuchadnezzar was not a man who allowed lawbreakers to go unpunished. In an ancient cuneiform writing, Nebuchadnezzar was described as so devoted to justice that he did not rest night or day. And so the document also tells of a criminal guilty of a second offense who was decapitated. And afterwards, the stone image of his head was displayed as a warning. All right, verse 7. The crowd's going to obey Nebuchadnezzar's command. Verse 7. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So Nebuchadnezzar's grand idolatry was accompanied by music, elaborate and it's well-produced music. This is going to remind us of the great inherent power in music, both for good and evil. And according to Baldwin, to fall down and worship the golden image literally reads, as soon as they were hearing, they were falling down. So there was total and immediate obedience to Nebuchadnezzar's command. And afterwards, the stone image of his head, you know, all right. Verse 8 through 12. We see certain Chaldeans are going to accuse his three Hebrew men. Verse 8. Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a, de a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. And so these Chaldeans had an obvious political motivation against these Jews who were promoted to high office along with Daniel in the events that are recorded in the previous chapter. And apparently, <clears throat> their failure to worship the image was not discovered until these certain Chaldeans made it known. Uh, with so many thousand of government officials in attendance, it'd be easy to overlook these three. And additionally, we see from this that these three Jewish men did not lodge a formal protest. They simply just refrained from sharing in the sin of idolatry themselves. <clears throat> and so their actions were not public, but neither were they hidden. These three Hebrew men must have known that they were going to be discovered, yet they obeyed God rather than man. Verse 13 through 15, Nebuchadnezzar is going to interview these disobedient Hebrew men. Verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Okay, so <clears throat> he says, is it true? So to his credit, Nebuchadnezzar did not accept the accusation on hearsay. He made sure of it with a personal interview. Uh, this was an even greater test for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's one thing to make a stand for God. It's a greater thing to stick to your stand when pointedly asked, Is it true? Peter followed Jesus after his arrest, but he wilted and denied Jesus when, when he was asked, Is it true? And so Nebuchadnezzar would not tolerate losing face on such an important uh, occasion. His pride made him declare, You shall have no other gods than me. And we can imagine this enormous pressure on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to compromise. Everything in front of them, the king, furnace, the music, their compatriots, their competitors, all of it conspired to convince them to compromise, yet God was more real to them than any of those things. And so <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar thought nothing of insulting all gods with this statement. He is more of a secularist or a humanist than he is a theist. The God he really believes in is himself, not the gods of Babylon. Verse 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, 
we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And so they had no need to defend themselves. Their guilt in the matter was clear. They clearly would not just bow down to this image. And so in this, the Jewish men showed a good understanding and appreciation of God's great power. In fact, they knew that God was able to save them from both the burning fiery furnace and from the hand of Nebuchadnezzar himself. And so he says, but if not, so in this, the Jewish men know and they're going to show that they have a, uh, a good understanding and appreciation of submission to God. They knew God's power, but they also knew that they must do what is right, even if God did not do what they expect or hope him to do. And so we often complain about our rights and what's fair, and often it's better to make a stand and endure our difficulty, leaving our fate in God's hands. And they did not doubt God's ability, but neither did they presume to know God's will. In this they agreed with Job, though he may slay me, yet I will trust him at Job 13:15. And they recognized that God's plan might be ful- might be different from their own desires. I have my own desires and dreams and I pray that God fulfills them, but if he doesn't, I can't turn my back on him. And so these were men who did not love too much. There are popular self-help books that hope to help people who seem to love too much. Yet many Christians are hindered because they love, you know, they love too much. Remember that early Christians were not thrown to the lions because they worshiped Jesus, but because they would not worship the emperor. All right. So in our day, many do love Jesus and think very highly of him. Yet they are far from God because they also love and worship the world, sin, and their self. In 1 John 2 verse 15 where it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. So it took a lot of faith to say this. God brought them to this place of great faith by preparing them with tests in less dramatic areas. And so these men stood firm when they were challenged to eat impure foods and when they saw God bless their obedience. This gave them the courage to obey now when the stakes were much higher. And many fail in their obedience because they wait for something big to test their faith before they really start to obey God. Some fill their life with many small compromises, yet they tell themselves that they will stand firm when it really matters. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego show us that obedience to God in small things is what really matters. And so the statement of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is also remarkable for what it does not have, any hint of an excuse. In a time of testing like this, it's easy to think of a thousand excuses that seem to justify compromise. Verse 19 through 23. These three men are going to be cast violently into the furnace. Verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated, and he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. And these, then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their outer, their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because of the king's command was urgent, and the furnace was exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace." So Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. So no matter how brave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, facing the fury of the king was still extremely intimidating. We get the feeling that prior to their statement, Nebuchadnezzar spoke kindly, almost in a fatherly manner to these wayward boys. Uh, After hearing their bold challenge, the expression on his face changed. <clears throat> and so everything was done to make sure that these three Hebrew men were quickly and completely burned. They, they made it exceedingly hot, seven times more so. All right, verse 24 through 25, Nebuchadnezzar is going to see four alive and well in the furnace. 
Verse 24, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king, look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And so, it's astonishing that anyone survived for a moment inside the furnace when others perished at the door. And the Septuagint will say in Daniel chapter 3 verse 24 that Nebuchadnezzar's attention was caught when he heard the men singing praises in the furnace. We can imagine that the king had cast them into the furnace and didn't intend to look twice, believing they would be immediately consumed in the fire. As he walked away with a satisfied look on his face, he was immediately stopped by the sound of singing coming out of the furnace. And at a safe distance from the raging heat, he peered inside and saw four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. And so, if this singing in the furnace is true, it's going to remind us of Paul and Silas singing in the Philippian jail in Acts 16, verse 25. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to tell us who this fourth person was, the Son of God. Jesus was literally with them in the worst of their trial. This is one of those Old Testament uh, incarnations of, of Jesus. Jesus. Right? He comes through the woman once, but he makes many appearances throughout the Old Testament. And this is one of them. And so we don't know if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that the Son of God was with them in their, in their fiery trial. Sometimes we are aware of Jesus' presence in our trials, and sometimes we are not. But he is there nonetheless. And Spurgeon will observe that God's people are often in the furnace. And though there are different kinds of furnaces, they serve similar purposes in our life. And so if this singing in the furnace is true, it reminds us of Paul and Silas in that Philippian jail. Uh, But there's a furnace that man prepares, there's a furnace that Satan prepares, and there is the furnace that God prepares. And God can deliver us from a trial, or he can miraculously sustain and strengthen us in a trial. And so Trapp will quote an English martyr who said that this, uh, who said this as he was burned at the stake. He said, O ye papists, behold, you look for miracles. And here now you may see a miracle, for in this fire I feel no more pain than if I were in a bed of down, but it is to me as a bed of roses. And so Nebuchadnezzar also observed that the four men were free in the fire. The fire only burnt the ropes that bound them. Verse 26 and 27, the Hebrew men leave the furnace unharmed. Verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and king's counselors gathered together. And they saw these men, on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. And so before they were out of the furnace, Nebuchadnezzar recognized that these men served the true God, the God of the Most High. The trial had no power over these men because they were thoroughly submitted to the power and will of God. Before the time of Jesus, they knew the truth of Jesus' promise in John 16, verse 33. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And so the smell of fire was not on them. And this is going to demonstrate how complete their deliverance from this was. And this whole account is going to illustrate, perhaps serving as a type of a future of Israel during the Great Tribulation. Nebuchadnezzar is like the Antichrist who forces the whole world into one religion of idolatry. Nebuchadnezzar's image is like the image described in Revelation 13, that the whole world will be commanded to worship. And the fiery furnace is like the Great Tribulation, which will be great affliction for the Jews. And the three Hebrew men are like Israel, who will be preserved through the tribulation. And the executioners who perished are like those in league with the Antichrist, who Jesus will slay at his return. And the mysteriously absent Daniel is like the church, not even present for this time of great tribulation. All right, verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar is going to acknowledge the greatness of the God of the three Hebrews. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies. 
that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. So Nebuchadnezzar gave glory to God, but he recognized that this great god is not his god. He was still the god of these three brave men. And so in Daniel chapter 3 verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar asked, "Who is the god who will deliver you from my hands?" Now Nebuchadnezzar knew a great deal about this god. He is the God of the Hebrews, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He is the God who sends a Savior. He sent his angel. He's a God of great power. He delivered his servants. And he's a God worthy of trust, right, who trusted in him. All right, so he's also a God worthy of full surrender. He frustrated the king's word, and they yielded their bodies. And he's the God who demands exclusive allegiance that they should not worship or serve any other god except their own god. So Nebuchadnezzar knew a lot about God, but he did not yet know him personally. But he will when we get to the next chapter. And so they yielded their bodies. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego surrendered themselves completely to God, body, soul, and spirit. It was the kind of submission that Paul wrote of in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, when he says, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And so this whole account is a powerful illustration of the principle of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We see Satan trying to make the believer bow down to his idealized image of what men and women should be. Christians must resist this with everything they have and pursue God's ideal. In this, we will fulfill Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right, verse 29 and 30, Nebuchadnezzar is going to make a proclamation that nothing evil should be said against the God of the Hebrews. Verse 29, Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made in ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And so... He makes a decree. So the three Hebrew men did not ask for Nebuchadnezzar to make this decree, and they probably didn't want him to. Uh, coerced worship isn't good, either towards an idol or, to or, or towards the true God. God wants true worship. And so there is no other God who can deliver like this. So seeing God at work in the life of his people was an extremely effective testimony to Nebuchadnezzar. Do people see God at work in your life? And Paul expressed the same idea in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. All right, so let's revisit this and see if we can see something deeper. So comparing Daniel 3 with Revelation chapter 13, we will note that both will talk about a forced worship of an image. And Nebuchadnezzar here being an Old Testament type of the Antichrist, this world, you know, that was the known world at the time, the Babylonian Empire, and he was that world leader demanding worship of himself. And you'll compare that with Babel, with Nimrod, and that one enforced religion as well in Revelation 17 and 2 Thessalonians 2 where this Antichrist will set up and demand worship of himself. And so <clears throat> we're also going to have this mark of the beast, right? Uh, barcodes, microchips, uh, and compare that with the seal of the Holy Spirit. And the fiery furnace to being an Old Testament type of this tribulation uh, deliverance is found in Isaiah 43 and Daniel 9 as well. The men were destroyed by the flames in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, and Revelation chapter 20, when everybody's tossed into the lake of fire. And so the three youths of Israel, you know, is that a type of the 144,000 that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 and 15? And so fire is an idiom in Scripture. Fire will speak of God's presence in Exodus, or his pathway in Exodus 13, or his precepts in Exodus 19, or God's punishment in Genesis 19 and Leviticus 10. It will speak of God's power in 1 Kings 18, right, when Elijah called down fire. Uh, God's protection in Daniel 3 here. 
and then God's prophecy in Second Thessalonians chapter one verse six through ten and Second Peter three ten as well. And so the missing element here, where is Daniel during this event, right? Why wasn't Daniel in the furnace? Daniel yielded to the king's challenge? Not likely, especially as we get to know his character further. Daniel was exempted from accusation by his enemies? Not likely. Daniel had been removed from the situation. Perhaps he was on an errand for the king. Right? He was one of these top dogs. He was promoted to like second in command in Babylon, much like Moses was in Egypt. And so Daniel's absence may have been viewed as his rival's opportunity. Maybe he was out on affairs of the kingdom. You know, so was he absent on affair of the state? And we'll note the Istanbul prism. We'll list three. That's a uh, artifact, one of Nebuchadnezzar's artifacts. Uh, we'll note that it lists three, but there's no mention of Daniel in that. Uh, to compare that, we will say that the church is not mentioned after Revelation chapter 4. And we'll see this one integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. All right, And so I'm saying Daniel here is either an Old, an Old Testament type of the church being absent. And I'll let you look through that to dig it out yourself. The next session is going to be a lesson on pride. Chapter 4 is written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. And uh, we're going to talk about why I believe we'll see him in heaven. All right. And you'll find more study material at taylorbiblestudy.com.